Let us consider this problem. The human eye opens at a rather late stage in the development of the individual. He has already done the most marvelous work he will ever do. In a mysterious way, in his mother's womb, he has built a human body. And this body has organs that are directed to certain ends and intentions. And these were not the organs designed by reason, designed by consciousness. Reason and consciousness comes to itself and asks later, what is it I'm all about? What is it I am here for? What is it I'm all about? What is it I am here for? Why is it I do this and that? Why is it I do this and that? What is it I'm all about? What is it I am here for? Furthermore, the coming of the eyes into the general biological picture is very late. Life had already originated hundreds of millions of years before eyes opened and saw what was going on. Saw what life was doing. Now if you'll see and think what it is that life does, that life has to do in order to be life, it has to kill and eat other life. That's the basic thing. This is a rather monstrous thing. And when the eyes see what the situation is on which its own life depends, its own existence, when conscience and consciousness become aware of the preconditions of their own existence, there is often a sense of shock, a sense of horror. You know, the basic word of Buddhism, all life is sorrowful. That's one way of recognizing this. There is also the feeling many have of guilt simply for being alive. This is, in a way, symbolized in the image of the fall in the garden. Life is monstrous.
there happen to be whole large parts of adult American life that nobody talks about in commencement speeches. One such part involves boredom, routine, and petty frustration. The parents and older folks here will know all too well what I'm talking about. By way of example, let's say it's an average adult day and you get up in the morning, go to your challenging white collar college graduate job and you work hard for eight or 10 hours and at the end of the day you're tired and somewhat stressed and all you want is to go home and have a good supper and maybe unwind for an hour and then hit the sack early because of course you have to get up the next day and do it all again. But then you remember there's no food at home. You haven't had time to shop this week because of your challenging job. And so now after work, you have to get in your car and drive to the supermarket. It's the end of a work day and the traffic is apt to be very bad. So getting to the store takes way longer than it should. And when you finally get there, the supermarket is very crowded because of course it's the time of day when all the other people with jobs also try to squeeze in some grocery shopping. And the store is hideously fluorescently lit and infused with soul-killing Muzak or corporate pop. And it's pretty much the last place you want to be. But you can't just get in and quickly out. You have to wander all over the huge, overlit stores, confusing aisles to find the stuff you want. And you have to maneuver your junkie cart through all these other tired, hurried people with carts. And eventually, you get all your supper supplies, except now it turns out there aren't enough checkout lanes open, even though it's the end of the day rush. So the checkout line is incredibly long, which is stupid and infuriating. Stupid and infuriating. Which is stupid and infuriating. Stupid and infuriating. But you can't take your frustration out on the frantic lady working the register who is overworked at a job whose daily tedium and meaninglessness surpasses the imagination of any of us here at a prestigious college. But anyway, you finally get to the checkout line's front and you pay for your food and get told to have a nice day in a voice that is the absolute voice of death. And then you have to take your creepy, flimsy plastic bags of groceries in your cart with the one crazy wheel that pulls maddeningly to the left, all the way out through the crowded, bumpy, littery parking lot. And then you have to drive all the way home through slow, heavy, SUV-intensive rush hour traffic, etc., etc. Everyone here has done this, of course. But it hasn't yet been part of you graduates' actual life routine, day after week after month after year 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 day day after week after month after year day after week after month after year day day after week after month after year day day, day after week after month after year but it will be and many more dreary, annoying, seemingly meaningless routines besides. But that is not the point. The point is that petty, frustrating crap like this is exactly where the work of choosing is going to come in. Because the traffic jams and crowded aisles and long checkout lines give me time to think. And if I don't make a conscious decision about how to think and what to pay attention to, I'm going to be pissed and miserable every time I have to shop. Because my natural default setting is the certainty that situations like this are really all about me. About my hungriness and my fatigue and my desire to just get home. And it's going to seem for all the world like everybody else is just in my way. And who are all these people in my way? And look at how repulsive most of them are and how stupid and cow-like and dead-eyed and non-human they seem in the checkout line. Or at how annoying and rude it is that people are talking loudly on cell phones in the middle of the line. And look at how deeply, personally unfair this is. Or, of course, if I'm in a more socially conscious liberal arts form of my default setting, 
I can spend time in the end of the day traffic being disgusted about all the huge, stupid, lane-blocking SUVs and Hummers and B12 pickup trucks burning their wasteful, selfish 40-gallon tanks of gas. And I can dwell on the fact that the patriotic or religious bumper stickers always seem to be on the biggest, most disgustingly selfish vehicles driven by the ugliest... See, this is an example of how not to think. This is a very strange thing, you see, that it is partly true that the universe, so far as its biological aspect is concerned, is this weird system that lives by everybody eating everybody else. Only what we do to maintain what is called order and civilization is that various species make agreement that they won't eat each other. They'll cooperate and so be an enormous gang which can beat down the others. So the human being is the most successful so far of this gangster arrangement. We are the most predatory monsters on earth. And we have cooperated to assault the fish and the vegetables and the chickens and the cows and everything, you see. Only we do it by not letting our left hand know what our right hand doeth. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, unless gentlemen happen to be prone to going hunting as a sport, they don't see their food killed. They don't see the slaughterhouse. And so what you get in the butcher in the market, a steak, you know, is a thing in its own right. It has nothing to do with a cow. Steak is a thing shaped us and so, and it looks as if it might be like a banana or something like that, you know and nobody worries. And when a fish is served up, it does indeed look like a fish, but it's not the squiggly, squirmy fish that comes out on the end of the fisherman's line. You know, when you really fish, you realize that the fish doesn't like it very much. From this gangster arrangement, we are the most predatory monsters on Earth. So let me repeat, so let me repeat of this gangster arrangement, of this gangster arrangement. We are the most predatory monsters on earth. So let me repeat, so let me repeat of this gangster arrangement. There is that absolutely extraordinary side of things that is really terrifying. And so let me repeat, the illustration I used of the cross in the net, where one side of it is scissors that cut and eat teeth that chew, 
can get this thing in. And the opening side of it is like James Joyce's Ulysses, the girl who says yes, and I said yes, yes, yes. She wants to be absolutely ravaged by her man, see? So it's open, open, open. But now comes the, if we take the dark view of things, the horrible view, excuse me if I go into some rather grisly details, but have you ever heard of a vagina dentata? That is the idea that in the sexual organ of the woman there are teeth. And a lot of men have this fantasy and so are rendered impotent. They don't make love because they feel that the price of this blessed experience, this creative experience, loving experience, is you're going to get trapped. You're going to get emasculated. You're going to lose your precious member of this gangster arrangement. We are the most predatory monsters on earth. So let me repeat. So let me repeat of this gangster arrangement. Of this gangster arrangement. We are the most predatory monsters on earth. So let me repeat. So let me repeat of this gangster arrangement. And, uh, this is a very ancient fantasy. It appears throughout all known history. Because this is simply the woman's come on where she attracts, but she's out really to get you. She is basically a spider mother, she, <laughs> who is, is selfish and uh, doesn't really love you. Not really, but says she does. And of course, there are on the other side all the tricks of the men, which go without mention. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, someone, this is very serious, and I don't know if I should address it because I'm somewhat tired, but I'll give it a shot because it's important. Now, it's very serious and a troublesome question. I plan on taking my own life very soon. Why shouldn't I? Well, I'm going to assume this isn't a casual question, you know, that's being put out for the purposes of display. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is you have to think very carefully through the consequences of that for other people. So I've had clients in my clinical practice who've never recovered from the suicide of a family member. Decades later, they're still torturing themselves about it. And so that's what you leave behind. Maybe you're feeling life has been twisted against you and that people deserve to suffer for the misery that they impose upon you. But I would say, think very, very carefully before you go down that route. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing to leave people with. Part of the reason that suicide has been illegal in most societies is because it absolutely devastates the people you leave behind. And you might think, well, those people would be better off without me. And if you get really depressed, you can think that way. And you can even get to the point where you can't think any other way than that. If you're at the point where you can't think any other way than that, then you should tell someone and you should go to the hospital. Because that can happen, you know, it can happen if you get depressed. There are treatments for depression, you know, and many of them work for, for some people. They certainly beat the hell out of suicide. And even if they have some negative side effects, and sometimes they do, quite frequently they do, the negative side effects aren't fatal. I mean, there's lots of reasons that people get depressed that are very, very complex. 
Don't give up hope and do something final before you explore all possible options. And if you haven't talked to a psychologist, you haven't talked to a psychiatrist, you haven't tried antidepressants, you haven't revealed to your family or people that care for you that this is how you're feeling, then you owe it to yourself and them to explore every possible avenue before you take such a step. That's the other thing, you know, you, you have intrinsic value, and you can't just cast with it and to an end, you leave a hole in the fabric of being itself. A wise man that I once worked with said, You can always commit suicide tomorrow. You only get to decide that once. And you can put it off. So I would say just put it off. And then put it off some more. And see what you can do to put yourself together. If you're so hopeless that you have a suicidal plan, tell someone for God's sake, tell them. And or go to a hospital and tell them. And for sure, try antidepressants. But what the hell do you have to lose? Do everything you possibly can to address the issue before you do something like that. And do give some thought to the people that you're going to leave behind you. Because believe me, you may just absolutely wipe them out in a way that they will never recover from. You cannot fix someone's suicide. You're stuck with it. You torture yourself for the rest of your life. If I would have only known, if I would have only said something different. So don't be so sure that your life is yours to take. When you don't own yourself the way that you own an object. You have a moral obligation to yourself as a locus of a divine value, let's say. You can't treat that in cows. That's just, it's wrong. So those are the reasons. Explore everything you can explore and put yourself back on your feet. All the things, there's all sorts of treatments for depression. Don't leave the people around you with that to suffer from for the rest of your lives. Don't underestimate your value in the world. And don't underestimate the fact that suicide is wrong. So those are four reasons why you shouldn't end your life soon. About 290 years after Christ, a Roman emperor named Diocletian took over. He really grabbed the bull by the horn. He took over in a period of turmoil and severe depression. The first thing Diocletian did was call in the gold and close the banks and raise the taxes. He reduced the power of the Senate, delegated its power to a lot of little government bureaus. Do you know they even had a transportation act back there? 
prescribing the fee required to rent one laden ass per mile, and at today's rate of exchange, it would have amounted to about one eighth cent per mile, which meant that in order to make a profit, a jackass would have to carry five passengers. That was simply beyond the capacity of the jackass. Diocletian put millions of people on the public payroll, and this failed to do the job. The country was still in trouble. He asked more personal powers for himself. For a brief while, incidentally, they were standby powers, but then he used them all at once. He froze wages, he froze prices, he froze jobs, he stopped profits, he dictated to the farmer what he should plant, when and how he should sell it, and for how much, and he rationed food. And what happened? The labor market closed down. Incentive was gone. Farm life became dependent on bureaucratic red tape. Exorbitant taxes cost the farmer his land. He kept for himself only a small plot on which he might grow turnips for his family. He lost the rest of it to the states. And without food and with incentive gone, city life stagnated and declined. And Rome passed into what history has recorded as the Dark Ages, lasting a thousand years. Lasting a thousand years. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. A nation would evolve from a monarchy into an oligarchy, from oligarchy to dictatorship, from dictatorship to bureaucracy, from bureaucracy to pure democracy, where finally the people would cry out from the chaos and confusion of the streets, oh, please, God, give us a king, and God would give him a king. And they'd have a monarchy again and start the whole silly cycle anew. Now either we will profit from the errors of their ways, or it follows us the night the day, our children are going to have to relive the dark ages all over again. All over again. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. Take this kiss upon the brow, I'm in pine from you now. Thus much let me avow. You are not wrong, you deem that my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, and a vision or in night, is it there for the last gone? Grains of the golden sand Have you yet had a creep 
through my fingers to the deep while I weep, while I weep. Oh God, I cannot grasp them with a tight clasp. Oh God, I cannot say one from the pitiless way. Oh, that we see our scene has been a dream within a dream. Oh, that we see our scene. Clamor. 
first thoughts out of you for equality. Your most secret ambitions to be tyrants that shroud themselves in words of virtue, a grieved conceit, repressed envy, perhaps the conceit and envy of your fathers, erupt from you as a flame and as the frenzy of revenge. What was silent in the father's speaks in the sun. And I often found the sun on the sun. The unveiled secret of the father. They are like enthusiasts. But it is not the heart that fires them, but revenge. And when they become elegant and cold, it is not the spirit, but envy that makes them elegant and cold. Their jealousy leads them even on the paths of thinkers. And this is the sign of their jealousy. They always go too far. So their weariness must in the end lie down to sleep in the snow. Tarantulas. 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 Out of every one of their complaints sounds revenge. In their praise there is always a sting. And to be a judge seems bliss to them. But thus I counsel you, my friends. Mistrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. They are people of a low sort and stock. The hangman and the bloodhound. The hangman and the bloodhound, bloodhound, bloodhound. The hangman and the bloodhound, bloodhound, bloodhound. The hangman and the bloodhound, 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 bloodhound. Look out of their faces. Mistrust all who talk much of their justice. Verily, their souls lack more than honey. And when they call themselves the good and the just, do not forget that they would be Pharisees. If only they had power, 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 power. My friends, I do not want to be mixed up and confused with others. Some preach my doctrine of life and are at the same time preachers of equality and tarantulas. Although they are sitting in their holes, these poisonous spiders with their backs turned on life, they speak in favor of life, but only because they wish to hurt. Of contempt for existence itself keep coming. 
Waves of con- waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. There's a part of me that revels in riding these waves. But can I harness them for good? Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. It's probably time for a little bit of individual psychoanalysis. You're generalizing, you know, you say waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming, but I don't believe that that's exactly right. I'm certainly not accusing you of being deceitful. It's more like low resolution. My suspicions are is that there's a set of experiences that you've had that are characteristic to your own personal life that have caused you some bitterness and some resentment and that those haven't been thought through. Usually thinking through means trying to take as much responsibility for altering the conditions under which those things happen going forward into the future as possible. Like the purpose of memory is to stop you from doing the same stupid things in the future, right? If you've had experiences that have made you bitter and resentful or are still engaged in experiences that are doing that, then you need to do a careful microanalysis of what those are and see if you can see if you can flip your attitude in some manner. I'm not saying this is easy, but the first thing you could do is at least figure out what those memories are. You can kind of tell if something needs work from a memory perspective if it occurred more than about 18 months ago and when you remember it, it still causes like a wave of sadness or anger. Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. Waves of con- waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. There's a part of me that revels in riding these waves. But can I harness them for good? Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. What that means is that your brain is still targeting that experience as threatening and unexplored. And what that means is that in some sense part of you or a part of you that could exist is still stuck in that memory. back and do a careful causal analysis of the events that led up to the unfortunate circumstance yeah, try to map out your role even if your role is minor there's going to be things that you could have done differently to avoid it and that's what you need to figure out for the future i would say i would say you try to shed all your personal resentment a part of that too is to not take things too personally. There's nothing personal about the fact that terrible things happen to you, I mean, unless you're directly causally involved. Just as it says, I believe in the Old Testament, reigns on the just and the unjust alike. The tragedy and difficulty and even the confrontation with evil are built into the structure of existence. And it's not aimed at you personally may be the price that we pay for existence itself. You could say, well, that price is too high to pay. But if you start thinking that way, then you make everything much, much worse. Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. Waves of con- waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. There's a part of me that revels in riding these waves. But can I harness them for good? Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. It seems better to shoulder your cross voluntarily and stumble forward towards the light. That's the best strategy. And just because it's the best strategy doesn't even necessarily mean that it's always going to work. Like, this is no optimistic scenario. Like a dragon is no optimistic scenario. Confront the dragon, get the gold, bring it back to share with the community. And, you know, that sounds all well and good, but after all, it is a dragon and many people get eaten by them. The myth basically says, well, your best bet is to open your eyes and speak the truth and look forward. Forth 
forthrightly and confront the hydras that are raising their heads and their tentacles constantly to frighten you and stop you and to fight the tyranny of the social structure when it's oppressing you unduly. And that's what you have to do. But I would say if that contempt is there, man, that's really worth digging into. That would be the place where you would discover the union shadow because you would discover that contempt is an unbelievably destructive force. Contempt is a particularly destructive force. It would be useful for you to try to think about, you can use fantasy to do this. It's like, okay, if you let that contempt manifest itself fully in like a dream or a daydream, and then you let it go on a rampage. What's the vision exactly? I mean, is it the destruction of the town? Is it the destruction of the country? Do you want the entire world to blow up? Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. Waves of con waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. There's a part of me that revels in riding these waves. But can I harness them for good? Waves of contempt for existence itself keep coming. Or are there specific people that you're angry at, or maybe you're angry at yourself? Those waves of contempt are unarticulated elements of experience, and they're part of your shadow. So, can you harness them for good? Well, the more you understand your dark urges, the more likely you are to be able to regulate and control them and to use them as part of your power. A person who has authority is someone who's integrated the dangerous parts of themselves, and that's part of what gives their words gravitas and weight. And so, yes, I think you could, you could harness them for good. And I think that's the right thing to do, but it will involve a fair bit of painful soul-searching. self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive but it's pretty much the same for all of us it is our default setting hardwired into our boards at birth think about it there is no experience you have had that you are not at the absolute center of the world as you experience it is there in front of you or behind you to the left or right of you on your TV or your monitor. The world as you experience it is there in front of you or behind you to the left or right of you on your TV or your monitor and so on. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. Please don't worry that I'm getting ready to lecture you about compassion or other directedness or all the so-called virtues. This is not a matter of virtue. It's a matter of my choosing to do the work of somehow altering or getting free of my natural hardwired default setting which is to be deeply and literally self-centered and to see and interpret everything through this lens of self. 
people who can adjust their natural default setting this way are often described as being well adjusted, which I suggest to you is not an accidental term. The world as you experience it is there in front of you or behind you, to the left or right of you on your TV or your monitor. The world as you experience it is there in front of you or behind you, to the left or right of you on your TV or your monitor. I'm not. 
because the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. Troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Kind, kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Kind, kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. The. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves. Until each in its turn was consumed, and with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flame. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want it until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. What'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, well, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. If I were the 
or the devil. If I were the devil. If I were the devil. If I were the devil. Thank you.
Akira. 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 There is only one way to salvation, and that is to make yourself responsible for all men's sins. As soon as you make yourself responsible in all sincerity for everything and for everyone, you will see at once that this is really so, and that you are in fact to blame for everyone and for all things. Dostoevsky, I think, said something like, every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. It's a crazy statement, right? It's a crazy statement. And he was a pretty extreme person in many, many ways. But there's a level at which that's metaphysically true. You know, because what happens is that it's failure to act often that's the most catastrophic. It's to not do the right thing when the situation presents itself. It's very specific. You know, you're constantly in situations where you could do the right thing if you were willing to take a risk that's actually of relatively moderate size. And you know that you can take the risk and you know that you should take the risk and you don't. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. Every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. they didn't oppose grows a little bit and they shrink a little bit and that starts a loop hey and so and you say well how do you take responsibility for the world and the answer is well you also have to do it with a certain degree of humility because what do you know life is difficult process infinitely challenging, it's ultimately challenging because it's bounded by death and insanity and all these terrible things that can befall people. You need to, to chart a course that makes the travel worthwhile. To chart a course that makes the travel worthwhile. that makes the travel worthwhile. And that's not happiness. It's a much more profound idea than that. It's more like adventure, I would say. It's more like the great adventure of your life. It's more like adventure. adventure of your life. It's more like adventure. It's more like the great adventure of your life. That's a difficult thing. It's not a tropical cute cruise with a Mai Tai in hand, although maybe now and then it could be that. But I think human beings, you know, we're, we're very tough and combative creatures and we're really built for a load. You really see this hunger arising in young men for exactly a call to that kind of adventure. It's like, get the hell up, guys, get to work. There's things to be done. It's like, get the hell up, guys, get to work. There's things to be done. 
there's dragons to confront and things to set right. I believe that's the truth, and I believe that it's more powerful than fear and than suffering. And that's saying a lot. Because fear and suffering are real. It's more like adventure. It's more like the great adventure of your life. It's more like adventure. adventure of your life. It's more like adventure. It's more like the great adventure of your life.